Hello everyone, today we talk about the post-mid 14th century crisis and the resilience of Western markets and especially the Italian ones that as we've seen in other videos had been leading financially um, Europe right, and had been branching uh, into essentially the entirety of the Mediterranean uh, and beyond right and so represent a bit the, the major spin of uh, European economy at this point. As you know this system shrank, we will see it now, uh, its resize is uh, redimensioned by the crisis and so we focus today exactly on how the, the system reacted uh, to this and was able however to keep on going in spite of a uh, series of problems that uh, kept happening later namely as you understand for the Italians that had this the, the control of the eastern Mediterranean ports and so basically the end um, the western end of the uh, Silk Route branches the rise of the Ottomans uh, uh, really was. That's of course uh, evolving eventually in the 16th century we don't cover that today but we stick to this uh, late medieval dimension fundamentally. So again if you're interested there is a um, there's a video about medieval uh, economy, medieval trade, if you're interested specifically medieval Italy there is a playlist uh, also on that. We covered the Italian dominion of the Mediterranean and uh, financial hegemony right in uh, say the, the, the heart of, of medieval civilization as, a, as an introduction if you want to this or a, a problem if you prefer. And naturally we will keep looking at sort of more in-depth stuff. For example, I made a video about uh, the uh, uh, German and Italian trade comparison in the respective uh, seas, right, during the second half of the 14th century. is very connected to this, and there you see essentially the Italian decline, uh, also how, you know, big the system was compared to the the North Sea, the, the Baltic one, and giving some quantitative measure about uh, the, in fact, the, the broader picture. Um, so as we've seen also in many other videos dedicated to the mid 14th century crisis, the late medieval crisis if you prefer, uh, the Black Death that really I dedicated lots of videos to, um, Euro European population that uh, from the 11th century had grown up to perhaps 70 million right it's an insane amount of people i mean it, i i stress this all the time right the, the the impact of the 14th century crisis is immense it's probably a, a, even if a well known historiographical subject um it that has been widely researched etc it's it i don't think it's taught uh, in pop culture in the adequate way it actually impacted the entire uh, globe like people stick to oh look this disgusting thing that happened to people who die of you know bubonic plague oh my god this is the, the dark middle age actually the, the single most important thing that you have to look at that is the affirmation of the ancien regime right the collapse of the lower classes at that time the shrinking of the system the political compaction the actually the strengthening of, of the statal uh, realities at that point in spite of the in fact the, the shrinking of the territorial dimension um, it, it's incredibly interesting, also from a military point of view. Um, and um, But the, probably also the, the most shocking thing in absolute terms about medieval civilization is how freaking advanced and big it was, right? Especially before the crisis. In a sense, this video is also highlighting how robust Europe was, even after this major blow. And as we will see now, the Italian markets really show it uh, grandiously in, in a way. But they made other videos about the development of late medieval banking in Europe because this is taking on a, an ever more specifically, you know, European dimension, right? Especially in the banking sector, uh, and not all, just on the, on the internal routes, but also the ones circumnavigating the continent. For example, um, we'll talk about those uh, in other in other videos. We made, for example, some videos about 14th century Poland that was almost miraculously spared 
uh, from the, the the Black Death, and that, for example, like when you think about the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth historically in the following centuries, given the the the, the, the definitive moment that the late medieval crisis was, you understand was in part also at least it was fa favored systemically structurally by this this aspect, like from uh, late medieval times. So 70 million inhabitants made a video also, sorry if I repeat myself so, so much, but it's important to, to stress this because people do not, what, they watch only what the algorithm tells them, and they ignore that how much stuff there is out there that are uploaded already and specifically um, and pertinently to these topics. What about medieval demographics, right, which is also a very complicated topic in general, but it was by scale that big right million more million less right or even tens of millions more than million less hotly debated topic this is not the point the 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 point being that this system collapsed suddenly right um in determining a general slowing of of course from an economical point of view a, a bit all the productive system uh, including the commercial one Right. I don't want to force uh, parallelisms with current times, but reflect always on the moments of crisis and contraction, how they happen. Right? Some of you ask me, well, why don't you draw more comparisons with contemporary times? Because it's not the point. The point is understanding, first of all, what happened in the past. Right? The, given the superficial knowledge existing in general uh, about this topic it's better if you understand what happened in history rather than then you can draw your own conclusions if you understand the present by the way which is not necessarily um actually it's you know it, it's very likely not the case uh even more than than history itself uh, so we call this dynamic the 14th century crisis um and this hit uh, at least at, at the major level, what really sustained the economy, of course, the agricultural system, right? This was a overwhelmingly agricultural system in, in a pre-industrial reality. Um, and this sector was so impacted because the crisis diminished, essentially, the demand of the products, and it increased um, the productivity as a consequence through, for example, the abandonment of the less fertile lands, made some videos about this also in a broader environmental uh, way um, this uh, diminished the price of the same products and it uh, essentially encompassed all the economy thus causing the increase of the salaries in every sector right big shock uh, and when you look at the aforementioned factors you realize that this of course influenced the the consumer um, who with higher salaries and a lesser cost especially of food acquired uh, let's say again a, a greater acquiring power purchasing power that was addressed uh, oriented towards the manufacturing sector so we're talking mostly about clothing furniture and also housing right so literally the the ones also that people would live in not just buildings in, in a general sense right and all this determined a great impulse of uh the city manufacturers um growth all over europe as well right that was the essentially the, the safer um uh, area in which to invest beyond uh, of course, the land that came back to be, again, some also at a shorter range, the, sort of a more important investment compared to the financial um, speculation that had been occurring, of course, in the previous, in the previous centuries, also in an unprecedented way, in the history uh, of mankind. So you have this counter uh, stroke, like the, a growth was further uh, strengthened by trade with the Levant, right, uh, and that caused there, right, in the Near East, essentially the uh, failure of many uh, industries, many manufacturers. Uh, this 
tells you again how resourceful the West in this really was and how much, of course, the surrounding uh, economies depended on Europe. Right? When you look at the 80s of the 14th century, you realize that the after the, the, the major uh, wave of crisis, there, there is a, a steady revival, right? There is an adaptation of uh, the economy to these new conditions. And the growth that derived from these changes was favored, that's why we talk about them today, by the Italian merchants, all right, that had already been having a, a dominating position, in fact, in the, uh, in the continental and intercontinental commerce, by the way. Here we, we don't talk uh, the East, China, etc., but, you know, everybody knows, essentially, the, the spread of Christianity, the, you know, Western merchants up to there uh, under the Pax Mongolica, Marco Polo, etc. Um, in any case, um, the, the, the Italian merchants, in this moment of, of crisis, essentially refurnished all the European countries of, the, of, of those necessary raw materials and the various manufacturers commercializing the finite products as well, especially textiles, coming from pretty much everywhere um, Europe would get them from. The consequences of this Italian activity w were really evident in different fields, right? In the transportation sectors, for example, you see a remarkable increase in the maritime ones, and instead a the pauperation of uh, land transportation, uh, land routes uh, in general, especially between the Mediterranean and Western Europe, right? Um, much of this was dictated by political reasons as well. For example, the Hundred Years' War, right? You know that essentially French economy was engulfed into a much greater crisis because of the English chevauchée, the fact that basically that axis that had connected also partially with with Italy, the, for example, the Flemish manufacturers to the Champagne fairs, the, the Rhone Valley was was closed, um, it was contracted. There were actually new land routes that were open from the same Italy, for example, the Venetian Bavarian one uh, is quite a notorious thing about the Fonda dei Tedeschi in, in, in Venice. Um, but generally speaking, uh, first of all, maritime transportation was cheaper uh, proportionally, and definitely the heavy crisis of universal institutions, especially the rebalancing of the regional, provincial ones within the continent, had sparked also you know, instability to some extent, war, um, crisis that had been taking place also during within the same cities, right? Uh, the salaried workers had been rebelling. This is mostly what happened in Flanders, in in Italy. But you know there were major peasant uprisings, such as the, the Jacquerie. Uh, later on, you have uh, the the same ones in, in England. Um, then the the, the Hussites in Bohemia. Um, so that's also another. A bit of a different thing here. The Italians mostly operated uh, in, in Western Europe, uh, narrowly meant, um, and they and so the, the what had been objectively the major commercial routes, and so um, these had to be remodeled uh, on the basis of the political contingencies. And given that the Italians had a lot of maritime capacity, of course they opened other routes. For example, Genoa opened, as we will see now the notoriously the Atlantic route, um, as Venice and Aragon was actually kicking them out um, of uh, other Mediterranean areas. Uh, this also favored the age of exploration with these um, the Genoese uh, admirals, uh, marines, crews, and ships, meaningfully enough, at the service of the Iberian powers uh, and beyond. But they also favored, in fact, this new um, coastal connection in Western Europe, as we will see now, especially in Bruges. Um, in any case, this triggered all a series of important changes that, for example, reflected also in, in, in naval warfare, right? Uh, for example, the development of naval art art artillery would have happened anyway, but 
the um, increase of ship tonnage was um, um, a great deal of um, you know of, of a help right to, to stabilize it given the ship's inertia and weight um, uh, from uh, the the guns recoils at, at Similia right I have something in store about galley warfare in the early modern um, history but um, everything gets pleasantly connected through the my random topic speaking um, you have also perhaps in spite of the crisis an increase in the number of ships I would like to stress that the entire system as a whole like population available resources did shrink right but some long-range trade was in part actually augmented by this and especially for this as we've seen actually more expensive goods in part thanks to the fact that the elites were coming out uh, strengthened enriched by the crisis um, and so this brings old to, a, to an important level of of the institutionalization of commerce we will see now also what kind of business models and uh, and banking uh, uh, dynamics w would emerge because these were much more robust right the f the great medieval civilization had just been growing so it, it didn't really have a breaking method um, they lacked parachute at this point instead they began to cultivate that because they of course they were beaten by the uh, by that um, you know disadvantage and now they they were inventing something that was more expensive but also safer and so balancing the the ratio there something was more convenient for them uh, the Genoese uh, maritime trade is especially exemplificative of this dynamic right uh, the the Genoese ships reached and surpassed 1,000 tonnage of neat uh, weight. Uh, so we have a new system of prices uh, affirming concerning the freight that were discriminated according to the value of goods, right? Because you, you had to have a certain amount of just even infrastructural capacity the markets were much more scientifically controlled um, and regulated, right? Um, you could thus, in this way, transport more product. This, uh, this, this was an optimization uh, in that, and uh, the this was, of course, ever more important for for the smaller ports, of course. Um, but it's obvious that in the systemic imbalance, there was a greater need for uh, um, sort of more stable um, source of provisioning, right? With again, uh, countries that were uh, ever more far away, because as we've seen, actually the routes uh, pushed forward geographically, um, and so countries started becoming more dependent on, you know, also more distant economy. Um, we see this dynamic being engineered at the uh, higher business levels in especially we'll see now them in some detail Florence Pisa Genoa Barcelona as well um, so you see true insurance markets uh, being uh, built in these cities in the Mediterranean um, also there was probably a new different business that had been created, established, and would remain the one of the Tuscans, right? Uh, which was very advanced, however, for the time, and that can be defined as a system of companies, right? A sort of holding. Essentially, you had a leading company. That was located. Uh, historically, this was born in Florence, right? So, say it, the company was located in Florence, and it would participate with its wealth in a majority reform, um, and uh, and then other smaller autonomous companies that were located in the major European 
uh, Emporia, it, it they would be controlled within this with this hierarchy, right? With this coordination. This passed through so many different changes, like in the in accounting mm, procedures and things that actually defined also modern economy, right? And that were invented, I do still use today, and were invented at the time, and or were generalized uh, at this point to the system. And financially speaking, you see a regular market, in fact, of exchange letters uh, affirming itself in Europe, right? This was organized through a system of uh, banking um, squares that were characterized by the presence of uh, the same. Um, and the, so this thick groups of uh, mostly Florentine m merchants slash bankers, right? Because the system is still sort of uh, transitioning in that uh, different vest. Um, and this system was also located as a wall because these were all Western Europeans, in fact, within the boundaries of Western Europe, right? Uh, meaning that, of course, the major um, trade routes to be controlled were actually within the system rather than just getting the monopoly of them in a for example, with a naval policy uh, in the East. Right? That was given for granted, but it was important to have a firm presence in the major European markets to get that, that power. And these bankers, again, had a far-ranging political impact in many, uh, as you know, many also monarchic ventures. Um, in the, the, there was a massive finances system that was occurring at this point during the crisis that the kingdoms were chronically short of money. They would subcontract uh, these um, bankers, like some, for example, local resources, right? Like mining, um, ex extraction rights, or this kind of stuff, like depots of some particularly precious substance, whatever. The, um, so you understand that within the system, uh, essentially all Western Europe revolved around the Mediterranean commerce. Also, the Iberian Peninsula was gaining importance, including for the Italians, uh, both for uh, Europe and the Mediterranean, but for both um, ways, right, in, in terms of where, of course, the, 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 the resources came from, where they arrived. Um, and you find in this sort of broader balance between various areas of Europe, the market of Brugge, Bruges, in Flanders, that made you know, some interesting videos on it recently, just to, to understand better, we can, um, it, it, it can be defined at this point, in fact, as the meeting point, probably to also broader cultural areas of Europe, the, the Romance and the Germanic one, in a cultural sense. And this market was, the square was frequented really by foreign merchants for, for a very long time, right? Italian presence is quite uh, intense and this remains in spite of the general decline of the Flemish towns at this point in favor for the, actually, well, we're technically still the Flemish ones, but the ones of the north, like the ones that would become essentially the, the Netherlands as we define them, of course, after centuries of political stuff going on. Um, but um, these were the largest, right? So this is also typical. Today we do not talk about the, the rest. I have something coming on, on the Anseatic League and explaining a bit how especially Northeastern Europe was, was working in parallel and what kind of markets were developing at the time. But they were not so central, of course, as the Western, um, Southwestern ones, right? Um, so... Um, Bruges was um, also the point of arrival again of uh, Genoese, uh, Venetians, also through the canals, right, with the actual ships. And from the 20s of the 15th century, also from Florence, um, and uh, together with, of course, the merchants of the Teutonic uh, Anson, with their respective loads of opposite. Uh, origin, by the way, that favored the exchange. So, of course, the 
broader uh, Asiatic market hub was meeting in Bruges with the one of of, uh, of, of southwestern Europe. All right. And um, and this was intensifying, as we were saying before, properly the continentalization of all this trade. Uh, and uh, there, there were, of course, also historical land routes that kept going on. I mean, the Amber Road still had been, as you know, for um, for 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 millennia actually a a thing, right? Really, also VLN. But now. The system was also evolving much more towards the, the maritime dimension. Um, as far as the Italian um, textile manufacturing centers that were scattered a bit all over central northern Italy, wool uh, traditionally arrived from England. However, now Spanish wool was becoming more important. Right, it was a master system. Uh, uh, the Spain. Uh, especially Castille, was becoming by far the largest uh, wool producer in Europe, right? an, an immense disproportion, as we will see. There was actually southern Italian wool um, becoming you know, a thing, and it would be boosted forward by the same Spanish uh, when the Aragonese took over southern Italy for, for reasons that were like actually making these shepherds, the trans men in, in the Alpenites sort of opposing as a community the local barons that had um, that were a bit like the guys blackmailing even just the, the presence of the Aragonese um, uh, kings in, uh, in, in, the, in the realm uh, but again um, a disproportionate quantity due to the fact that large parts of the Iberian Peninsula had while potentially you know, uh, developable in agricultural terms, like had suffered for centuries a condition of, of war zone frontier that had heavily destructured like the, the previous um, uh, land exploitation means. And so there m massive amounts of land were dedicated to, um, to, to cattle, um, to uh, sheep breeding and they began to produce this disproportional amount of wool that began to, to export all over, all over Europe. Uh, this also affected North Africa because the Barbary wool became completely secondary in this process. It had had some importance, like the, the Berber shepherds of North Africa had, had sold to Europe in part this, um, their, their product, um, and it, it uh, it, it was mostly Mallorca that at this point became the main market for this business, so that was absorbed still but within a, a Spanish system. Uh, also, Provencal wool had been a thing, and at this point it's declining because of again of a, the, also just a major um, decline in the Rhone uh, Valley uh, trade highway, right? Silk for the Italian um, cities that worked it was imported uh, in large quantities from Spain, from southern Italy, especially the silk of Calabria and the one of Sulmona in the Abruzzi, also from the Marcus, uh, from Modigliana, etc. Uh, because these places had been imported in that. Um, in the previous millennium, it had somehow specialized. Um, the it is true that the Persian silk and the Peloponnesian one uh, would still be imported in large quantities, but the um, Italian productive increase which is massive in the 15th century, depended on the Western European silks, right? And with the 16th century, we will not see it today, but essentially the silks worked in Italy w had become almost all Italian, right? They had been imported in everything. At this point, um, you see it. There's another video made on this. Um, I want to have to re-upload, actually, because of the pictures, but... That explained how also lots of during this crisis lots of Flemish weavers, for example, 
masters, most of, of course, had been actually invited to Italy and to, to settle there. And that's where, in fact, the Italians began to, uh, to reach and surpass the quality of the Flemish textiles, right, that had been the, the more refined. Um, in, and so you understand how, again, everything was ever more European wide, but also much more stable, stabilized. But this is an incredibly important and overlooked aspect. You know, they don't fo focus on economic history, but late medieval economy tells you to, to an incredible degree how much of today's European intertwinement was founded at that point. We have uh, grit becoming ever more indispensable for uh, silk work was imported this from the entire Western Mediterranean, north and south. Uh, Barbary, Spain, Provence. After the War of Chioggia between Venice and Genoa, we're talking 1376-1381, the definitive Venetian supremacy in the spice trade uh, brings uh, the the Serenissima to, to look further even west, right? Not just consolidating in the east, like the Genoese were not completely ousted. It was not really possible, even just with the with the politics, but the, even the, the naval technology of the time to simply blockade uh, a stretch of sea or whatever. Of course, the Genoese maintain important outposts in Crimea and um, in the Black Sea uh, in general. And uh, yet, right, Venice is sort of the more built-up uh, maritime power. Genoa and Venice had spent a, a traumatic amount of wealth, of, of resources in naval water. Like, if, if what you you can legitimately ask yourself if the Italian states had invested the, all that wealth into a land dimension, what would have happened to, to Italian politics at that point? It, to Europe in that regard, but it was still more profitable, of course, to control, to invest these resources in the fleets protecting sea trade, right, that was all what this war was about at the end of the day, at Chioggia, Venice risked to be actually knocked out by Genoa, but uh, on the medium run, right, Venice was just the strongest uh, to recover uh, because of its, again, more cohesive political system internal. We will have to talk a bit more about Venice and its local government. Um, so what what you see is um, you know this system, the Muda, which um, is essentially a major convoy, in fact sheltered by the by adequate naval forces. The Western one was known of Ponente, which which in Italian means in fact the the West. Um, the, and from the last decades of the 14th century, where you see, for example, some of you asked me about, why don't you make more videos about the condottieri? You see how actually the chronology goes all in parallel. From the last decades of the 14th century, you see that the soldiers of fortune, the great companies in Italy, sort of uh, vain. There is a, a political stabilization. The condottieri hired at this point are all Italian, which had never happened um, to, to that uh, degree. And you see a more subtle fashion, uh, let's say, affirming um, itself, a greater control, in fact, on the same commerce in this way. So you see the regularization of these mudas towards the West. Um, this was carried out yearly towards Egmont. This started from 1402. We were talking about Egmont the other day, looking at the negotiations between Louis IX and James I of Aragon. Louis the Ninth of France, of course, the saint, um, and we've seen there why that port was so relevant. It was connecting uh, the, in fact, uh, Montpellier w with the coastal uh, trade because the former city did not really have a port, and Egmont was not really much of a city center, but it had a hell of a, of a portal facility. Um, Venice starts doing this from 1436 with uh, North Africa, I mean the Barbary, so Northwestern Africa. And this also ended with the joining of the, all the 
all the ships that were employed uh, in the two convoys on the Spanish coast as a logistical basis. Uh, and this, again, because the Aragonese were sort of against Genoa, so they, they helped the Venetians in, in the business. The Genoese allied themselves with the Nazareth of Granada for that matter. This is also part of the reason why uh, Granada fell that, rel that late, right at the end of the 15th century. Um, but there were also specific commercial reasons for this. First of all, those were, as we've seen, the, the same ports where many spices literally arrived um, from North Africa, for example. Uh, and they were also the same centers from which you could acquire, uh, for example, the, the wool and the grit we were talking about before from Spain, from Provence still, that's still, however, in spite of the decline, still, of course, exported the stuff. The uh, wool weavers of Lombardy and uh, the Veneto area demanded um, these products on the market of Rialto, uh, that is Venice. Um, so it was very important for the Republic just to, to answer these um, these demands. And finally, uh, the Spanish connection was important to buy uh, the clothes, the ones from Catalonia, but also from Perpignan and Languedoc. So we were talking again just the other day, I, I can't avoid to make these references, but to the, with the Treaty of Corbeil, 1258, and how France and uh, the Crown of Aragon had basically defined this frontier right in south in, Oc in southwestern France right in Occitania uh, and these were historically all important um, cities that had enjoyed some also communal dynamism like probably the closest you find to at least back in the day to the Italian uh, communal development and for these centers Venice had definitely become the greater market, uh, which allowed them to redistribute their um, resources also towards the east. Because let's not forget that at this point in time, Europe has been exporting towards the east as well. I mean, in the ancient world you had, I don't know, the Romans importing grain from, from I don't know, today's Tunisia or Constantinople from, from Egypt. At this point, in the high middle ages you have Sicilian grain exported to North Africa, to Egypt um, again the, the Western European output is utterly insane uh, throughout um, all this period Genoa is also present in the Iberian Peninsula with the so called Società a Karate this um, was in, uh, as we were saying before in the realm of Granada, as we were saying before, uh, with, in fact, uh, the Ligurians maintained uh, for a long time the monopoly of the fruit commerce right, from that southern Iberian land. The Genoese, in fact, derived figs, resin, dates, sugar, silk, rice, cumin, um, the grit, oil. Uh, so you understand actually pretty lucrative business, even if minoritary compared to the Venetian one, right? There's also a matter of scale, right? It differs not just the quality of the products. It's dependent, of course, of the provinces that were accessible to them commercially. Um, and um, you uh, can imagine how after the fall of Constantinople, by the way, in 1453, the Genoese presence in the Western Mediterranean sort of came back because uh, the, the fall of the Byzantine capital to the Turks had, uh, as we'll see better now, de deteriorated like uh, the Venetian trade in the East. Right? At some point, the Venetians, of course, were some of the bitterest enemies of the Turks, but also they traded with them uh, during the truces, uh, and um, this was, of course, a mutual benefit. But that that blow helped the, the Genoese a bit. Um, the Genoese moan of Chios, 
in Greece um, uh, realized other commercial monopolies, such as the one of uh, Mastic. In the first place, it was redistributed uh, in all the Levantine countries. The one of Alum, obtained by essentially uh, concentrating within uh, in the, the, the reproduction of the same in the island of Fosia um, and uh, thus also spreading this in, in the Aegean and Black Sea distributing it from there in the Mediterranean in the North Sea as well Genoese uh, alum was you know just pretty much a hallmark of the Ligurian commercial power and in the western Mediterranean as in the North Sea the Genoese ships redistributed also the Lombard vod that was just across the the Apennines in the interland and Milan at some point would also Germanize Genoa was trying to escape we also we're seeing the French support we'll see it hopefully in next Milanese history uh, chapter because we have exactly the late Middle Ages left for the regional series episode and um, and so of course you understand how in spite of the preeminence or this or that power at the end of the day the, there was a general Italian monopoly that floated also that for which not one single guy would be able to prevail over the other in fact think about Florence I mean Florence did not have a maritime capacity on its own Florence was a was a continental power but of course being having been essentially at the beginning of, of the 14th century the, the richest city in the entire world was deeply connected with maritime trade as well. It had just financially the capacity to uh, keep certain, um, let's say, in Tuscany, the, the the access to the sea open through the alliance with Siena. And there are again, I talk this uh, probably after Milan. We will talk Florence a bit more. Um, and for this reason, the Florentines that had maintained their this massive banking capacity on their own, despite the there wouldn't even be a, you know, a firm provincial power to to some extent. Were very very watchful, and attentive and present. By the way, um, in all regarding uh, all the uh, the Western European matters. I mean, everywhere. If you read chronicles like the one of uh, Giovanni Milani, that was, for example, a, a merchant uh, aside from a, a magistrate. Um, himself uh, in the city like you realize that the scope the breadth of these people's uh, knowledge information uh, news like these people knew everything about what was happening between France and England but even just as the most basic elementary knowledge right about things that were happening at that given time uh, the guys traveled extensively they had again connections with the courts Today we do not observe specifically this aspect, but it was a very great contact with um, this area. It's not just anecdotal. I mean, there were even mercenaries, uh, right, employed, uh, hired in in Lombardy, in uh, in Tuscany by Philip the Fourth, for example, to fight the Flemish. All revolved around those those trade hubs in a way. Um, and so when when you look at the Florentine uh, 14th and early 15th century history realized that the city had this m m very big um, companies systems, right, groups, uh, uh, almost companies guilds, right, something, again, incredibly structured. Nobody really had this elsewhere um, in, in the world uh, and located in the three major centers of the North Sea that were in fact Bruges, London and Paris through the Seine um, so that's the triangle we were talking about before Flanders, England, France right um, and they had also very equally important groups in Provence, in Languedoc 
and uh, companies of safe interest in Catalonia and Aragon. The Alberti company uh, is perhaps the bigger one of the period and it seems to be willing to cover basically the entire spaces touched by the Florentine trade. This is basically the, the entirety of Western Europe. The Albertis had companies or firms in London, Bruges, Paris, um, in Lisbon that depended uh, on its traffic on the, the aforementioned North Sea um, markets, then Malaga, Denia, uh, Valencia, Barcelona, also fans in, in Morocco, Rhodes, um, then of course in Italy you, you have them in Venice, uh, Bologna, of course the native Florence, Pisa, Rome and Palermo and the various seas of the Albertis companies show this particular characteristic that is to say um, the triangular commerce essentially um, with between Italy the Iberian Peninsula North Sea and also with a tiny appendix towards the Levant in Rhodes right um, this is also remarkable because Florence again does not have a navy does not have a maritime power whatsoever they're, they're continental reality yes in the 15th century they, they will open some ports but it's not like you know like Genoa or Venice those, those are you know superpowers in their own regard um, Florence especially throughout all the, the 14th century is a land power it doesn't doesn't have an access to the sea even right um, so in spite of this their financial power and commercial penetration is that massively scaled right they maintain this um, this we will talk about Florentine banking in some greater depth because I, I realize we never talked to Medici as, at least as far as that is concerned that aspects is concerned but I think it just made one video about the Medici in total which is insulting for a video dedicated to medieval uh, for a channel dedicated to, me to medieval history that has almost 2,000 uh, videos so I uh, you know I don't know how that happened if, if you ask me but again we will have to fix it um, so this broader space is as you understand also culturally speaking there is a massive cultural influence from there right this is these are the same generations of which I don't know even the nobles of Europe start reading Boccaccio's the camera you have Florentine culture spreading at greater levels. You have the Medici themselves marrying with uh, royalty. You have a patrician um, sort of emulation by the by the, the feudal world and vice versa, right? There, it, this is how the the European elites, whether it were feudal extraction or patrician e extraction, basically culminate together into the ancien regime, right? And because of this disproportionate wealth that could make effectively a, a commoner as powerful as the most powerful of the um, noblemen uh, in Europe, um, and as we are saying, this this European uh, agglutination, like also from a cultural, literary, artistic profile, is of course taking place. This is also the the age of humanism. Uh, the age of the Renaissance that is is, is coming basically, um, and the geographical vastity of this trade is is fascinating. Um, you see again the preponderance of the Florentines as well among the other Italians, which you know if you pick I don't know a Sienese or or a Placentine you can say well okay those were important markets uh, you know they had important banks etc. An important resources they traded everywhere but they're sort of smaller powers right but we're talking here also Venice we're talking Genoa so it's Florence's power is is remarkable in this financial regard right uh, the commune of Florence did have some minimal seaborne power as far as these merchants were considering uh, considered uh, in a civilian vest right they were 
proper galleys at, at some point of the f uh, commune of Florence. And you start seeing this, in fact, in the 15th century. This, um, the, there is an, organi um, an organization, the, the Sea Councils, the Council of the in 1422. Um, this was the um, first time, like a convoy, of two ships, right? This is just ridiculous, as I was saying before, compared to the, again, the, the Venetians, the Genoese. But there is a fir first one towards Alexandria of Egypt, right? In 1423, a ship was armed for Egg Moth. 1424, two ships left for Catalonia. In 1425, a convoy of three ships went for the first time um, across Gibraltar towards Southampton and Bruges, right? You have the first travel towards Constantinople seemingly in 1429, right? So you have, for roughly half a century later, continuous travels of this, again, small convoys um, towards, uh, uh, again, Levant, uh, mostly Barcelona, the, um, the North Sea, you have some journeys also to Tunis and Sicily that were closer, but um, even if not as important for their trade. And again, that's also how Florence participates in, in spite of all limitations um, of, of a, uh, let's say, in terms of him, uh, disposing of a true naval power. Obviously, the main beneficiaries of these activities were the city manufacturers. There was a constant contact um, with the, the ports, with the markets, um, so that they would know essentially how much of the, their product was needed. Uh, so think about all the, the supplies, like the, the logistics, the administration behind this. Uh, most of this is private, by the way. And also what essentially the communes create is often subcontracted, as you understand. And uh, it's not just because the people who run the, the, the companies also run the city in, in some way, but uh, because just it was the easiest thing to do. Like, the state is not so pervasive as, you know, in the Middle Ages, even though these are some of the most civilly advanced um, uh, polities uh, in the continent. Um, and um, you have still some need, of course, of uh, raw material provisioning. Florence, for example, during the 14th century crisis, since it was a very big city and it had this massive financial um, affluence, they, they could uh, import grain, enormous quantities of grain from far away, right? Smaller cities, in a sense, declined also in favor of the regional states because they were run by these bigger centers because they could not afford that, right? So they declined quickly. Um, in Florence, I mean, controlling the, the, the grain supplies was controlling the city, factually. Well, this had always been the case um, in the urban centers, but here it's heavily enhanced under a, a subtle control. Um, you see the redistribution of the wool manufacturing uh, of Flanders, Brabant. England, Ireland, Normandy, Languedoc, Catalonia, Tuscany, Lombardy, Veneto, Liguria, right? Uh, all the rest of Europe and the Mediterranean, including the Levant, North Africa, uh, all the system is connected. And with the end of the 14th and the beginning of the 15th century, you also have, uh, we were hinting at before, the growth of silk production, the development of this sector, specifically in Florence, in Genoa, also the rein uh, reinforcement of the productions in Lucca, in Bologna, and Venice. In the 15th century, you have the Italian silk products exported in the same Levant. That makes you understand how, again, massive European power was at this point. I mean, traditionally, silks were imported from the Levant, right, and from much more faraway places. Right, Persia, China. At this point in the 15th century, you have these um, Italian industries essentially exporting silk to Levant. Right, this this flips the game and tells you again how bulky Europe is. Right, how massive um, in 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 actual 
infrastructure and, and resource management and, and political control um, and moral material force the, the, the continent is, right? It, it's truly remarkable. It, it's shocking, to say the least. So this new situation um, definitely witnesses Europe as fully protagonistic. But I, I care about this topic for, for a reason. You remember when, when we make all those videos about the Ottoman wars, right? And so the idea that the Ottomans were this constant threat and whatever. The reason why the Ottoman Empire lasted so long is simply that Europeans were just too fatly rich and sat there and didn't give a damn because, of course, the, the Ottomans would have never arrived uh, on, on the mouth of the Thames, as Gibbons <laughs> says, you know, if they hadn't been stopped at, at the end or whatever. This is not to say that the Turks were not a threat. But the point is that if Western Europeans had united forces just for once, the Ottoman Empire would have been wiped out in the blink of an eye. This is actually even known, right? If you read Machiavelli, he's, he's extremely clear about that. That after all, it's just about taking Constantinople. And that in many ways, with this constant Turkish threat, which is just a reflection of the European political divisions, um, and not actually much of a of an absolute threat per se. I mean, the, the Ottomans were really not fostered by Europeans, but in a sense, if again, if, if they had, if Europe had wanted to stop the Ottomans. I, even after 1453, and you look at the, the, the Crusade of Belgrade, etc., if there had been just a common just effort aside from the, uh, you know, essentially the Italians, the, the, the Central Europeans in part, and so the, the Balkans, the, those were in the first uh, row against the, the immediate Ottoman threat, the latter would have simply disappeared. And I don't think there is any... When you read this data, right, you, you can't see otherwise why, for example, the Ottoman Empire rose in the first place uh, in the face of this power. It, it simply doesn't make any sense otherwise. Right? That's the only logical, cogent, rational explanation. Among the other various things we could stress, like this is not, of course, to say that the Ottoman Empire again, in itself was a joke, absolutely not. But when you start reflecting on the fact that this was not a, a wolf front that they were facing and just a s substantially fragmented European situation. It was, they could afford that because it was actually just very, very advanced within the, the single places. And so they, they were aware, essentially, of their own possibilities and the risks uh, involved, even just in, in the risks and rewards involved uh, as a ratio in this, this game. They realized that Pretty much all of the system was due to it um, as well. Um, so all this wealth, by the way, needs new exchange markets, right? And here we have Switzerland uh, rising to an important degree. We have to talk about this, about Switzerland specifically in some more in-depth video, but let, let's make it long story short here. Let's try to make it at least. Um, you can argue that the greatest novelty under the exchange market in the 15th uh, century was constituted by the presence of the Italian merchants at the fairs of Geneva, right? Geneva constituted until the 60s of the 15th century the most important banking center in Europe, right? Um, and some of the Florentine companies present there were essentially one of the, of the silk makers because those fairs were also the major market of the luxury products in, in the West. And of course, silk was for, you know, the great clothing of the most powerful um, nobility uh, of the continent. And Geneva had made sense, because again, it was close to Italy, but also close to France um, and Germany, and so that's it, a very important crossroad. There's other seas there of, of, important, uh, of important banks. Um, and uh, these um, uh, Genevan fairs were essentially the medium to which we pass from the fairs 
a bit like we think that in medieval times this big um, periodical commercial markets of some sort to actually the exchange fairs right um, this happened also because Geneva constituted an Italian market north of the Alps and because most of that uh, enormous amount of wealth was being simply negotiated and say ad administered and sort of sorted out in its distribution in the sea right and so also much of the modern Swiss uh, banking system owes to the Italian system uh, back in the Middle Ages. And probably the, the physical presence of, of these um, Italian merchants, right? Uh, in these uh, fa fairs, the Swiss fairs, you would s encounter actually merchants and products coming from all over Europe. So there was still some sort of traditional market uh, activity of course but it's the exchange activity that at this point becomes prevalent for the first time in history right um, letters exchange letters were one of the greatest uh, you know inventions of course in in the history of uh, economics right and they had affirmed themselves to to the degree at this point that of course, the products themselves, that's what the, was the point. You didn't have to bring all the, the actual wealth, right? The actual money with you. You just had this bank notes, right? And the same goes for the same products and how these were, I mean, those would be transported, but moved from also other places. This was the meeting ground where the, the brokers met, right? And they made the deals. Um, uh, this is um, the case, for example, of the... Della Casa and Guadagni Company that operated uh, between 1450 and 1464. In this company, we see how the movement of exchange letters surpassed markedly the mercantile one, not only for the monetary value, but also for the income gain. Right? This is where the big money is made. Um, the general situation um, of the 15th century, however, did um, deteriorate for the Italian commerce as we were recalling before broadly because of the fall of Constantinople in 1453 right the Genoese were to lose eventually you know the, the Ottomans took over the uh, the Black Sea colonies uh, I made a video about this you know in Mills recents even though it's in a sort of a descriptive way um, the, the Venetian one also was the, the most directly impacted because essentially the Eastern Mediterranean was sort of, you know, Venetian business, so when you, the Ottomans rise, everything becomes a bit more complicated, to say the least. Florence exploits, in a very shrewd way, this crisis, because it, profiting, essentially, of the weakness of her competitors, she um, worked, uh, she made a consistent effort of being more present, in the same Constantinople and as well as in other Turkish cities to basically say well look you know we, we don't have like as Florentines any major you know, we don't feel particularly threatened by the Turks I mean they, actually the Italians felt threatened by the Ottomans at this point um, but as we were saying before like to a, a very large degree of still say declining of the situational decline uh, nation of the, the basis of their own interest we can, we can say and Florence was not a threat also to to the Turks as we've seen uh, the Florence did not really have much of a naval power uh, they were located in central Italy on, on the Tyrrhenian and so they could and here the policy of the equilibrium of the balance after the Treaty of Lodi 1454 tells you if you want a lot I made a video about that the, the Italians had formed a sort of um, federation that had of course the primary task of keeping the Turks out but as far as the, the trade was concerned how much the Florentines could uh, provide they, they were signaling the Ottomans that they were sort of able to you know, cause problems to Venice in case 
things were needed so that they could profit in exchange. This was an old game that had already been happening when the Byzantines were there between the, the Pisans, the, the Genoese, the, the Venetians, right? Um, perhaps already from 1456, but surely from 1458, uh, the Florentine communal galleys sailed towards Turkey almost yearly until 1478. Um, for this reason, the real market of the most refined Florentine uh, garbed clothes had become Constantinople. Right, uh, the Florentine merchants sent there f from three to eight thousand clothes a year for tens of thousands of florins of uh, essentially of silk, and they received from Turkey Persian silk camlets, carpets, Genoa, Venice from their side kept trading with Levant also after Constantinople had fallen. Right. Um, important centers uh, such as Tana and Kaffa in the Azov of uh, Sea and Crimea respectively had fallen in the hands of the Turks. But at the same time, uh, like the latter needed Italian trade, just like basically any other Islamic power had had during the, the Middle Ages. Behind the Middle Ages, you see, uh, again, they, they couldn't really dislodge them from there because without them, you couldn't quite enter the broader market. And so, in the old Romania, right, um, considered the Ottomans, as you know, called themselves uh, the Ottoman Sultans Caesars of Rome, right? So, that's also quite telling. Actually, the Italian trade flourished. Literally, as before, not, I mean, maybe exactly, but still in the sense that uh, the aside from the, the modifications that it would have over time, or the various wars of war fought, etc., the, the concept of you know, trade in this region had continued with Italy, what was kind of obvious. Right. Um, and there is um, an aspect that strengthens the uh, the economy in the 40, last 40 years of the 15th century, that is the rise and the affirmation of the fairs of Lyon. This starts, in fact, from the 60s of the 15th century, essentially because France has won the Hundred Years' War, so a lot of French trade routes can be, uh, you know, can be uh, used without much of a problem. Lyon was an important center, I mean, it's still today what you see with with France, essentially the only by scale important century is Paris, right? Except for Lyon, that would belong to this broader, older area of Burgundy and Marseille as a port. And Lyon is, in fact, a bit at the frontier with um, not too close, like, you know, but in, in the proximity of Italy in general. The same Switzerland, as we've seen, um, the Mediterranean, but not exposed like other centers in the south, including Marseille, would be. Um, and this brings, actually, the Florentines to leave G uh, Geneva for Lyon. In fact, the, I talked about this in Financing Early Modern Warfare, a video recently about how uh, banking for, you know, financing armies really, really worked in the following centuries, and the Lyonnais... Uh, bankers were in fact among the most important together with the Placentines, with the of course with the with the Bank of St. George in Genoa at a point to Fugger of course um, so you find again a lot of changes that we can't quite even cover uh, in detail um, and when you uh, when you look at Lyon you realize that the Florentine bankers number increases further right it's uh, the most consistent most powerful present in the Lyonnais fairs uh, in Lyon you find the concentration of wealth financial activity that will again favor as we were saying at the light motive this and other videos Europe as we know it right as the 
it, 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 it's culture that is sort of surpassing its um, old boundaries from within herself, right? So it's a Western, an Atlantic Europe that had this incredible gestation time after the Black Death and that fundamentally booms yet again because of the manufacturers of Western Europe that determines the, the, um, the increase, the accentuation of the Genoese interest and the greater Venetian presence in the Western um, part of the Mediterranean in the North Sea. And that will also be favored in part by the fall of Constantinople in Turkish hands that determined also this massive transfer of Genoese capitals towards the West. Whereas we've seen the, the Florentines dominated in their mercantile activity, but also in very high-level banking. Now, there are lots of considerations regarding this, because first of all, you, you're usually told that, you know, basically the Ottoman Turks conquer, um, you know, the, the Eastern Mediterranean, and uh, the Americas are discovered, and so basically Mediterranean trade and civilization fade, right? Um, this is debatable. Right, the the, mo the only moment in which Mediterranean economy was truly backwards in European history compared to at least Western Europe, European standards, as still a part of Western Europe, is the 19th century. Right, essentially, uh, you know that that's the only moment in which you can actually witness uh, a level of wealth and prosperity that is not the with Italy is, you know, left behind, right? Of course, we're including Spain as well, but talking about the major European powers, um, until the 18th century, Italy was pretty damn rich, uh, even if, you know, they didn't have a colonial empire that hadn't gone abroad, right, globally and whatever. Um, which means also that until the end of the 17th century, Italians were actually the richest people in the world uh, per capita, right? Then the English and the Dutch, arrive uh, but still it's a pretty advanced place right and second much of this dynamic is also let's let's skip the, the part of the age of exploration which as you know the Italians that give the same name to America etc are you know heavily involved uh, especially in Spanish service and, um, and etc um, but there is um, Italian management of Western finances continuing in late medieval Europe. Um, and that is actually the one that salvages the savable, if you want, salvages the salvageable um, uh, in, f in the face of the Turkish onslaught anyway. right? Parts of the part of the trade continues right? with the Ottomans. Uh, when the Ottomans are at war, say, with the Portuguese in the Indian Ocean, they make a truce with the Venetians, because the Venetians, of course, yeah, of course, the Atlantic routes were damaging them, um, but still, they got it, right, in terms even of naval power, etc. So there is a Mediterranean dimension, especially in early modern warfare, that must be reconsidered in this way. Other aspect is also this, this is true for all of Europe, but most, in fact, this Western one that we witnessed here, um, in terms of compartmentalization of resources, meaning this is evident uh, when the Genoese have to abandon the Black Sea, for example. They carry a lot of stuff back with them. Same goes for the, with the Venetians. They redraw their, their economic system to reinvest a lot of resources in the West, in the Western system. And adding to that built up, we see that the bankers of Leon being, uh, you know, being Italian in, in, in large numbers, um, even if these centers are ruled by the French crown and whatever, there is an in indestricable connection between these areas and the financing of the largest empires, right? This is true for the Fuggers in Bavaria. Um, this is true for the Bank of St. George in Genoa. These supply essentially the Habsburgic Empire, right? And the first go bankrupt, and the Genoese, in fact, are still there to do, you know, to continue doing what they do, right? And the Spanish Empire finds, you know, lots of precious metal in 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 America, etc. It brings it back, and it it does trigger some phenomena that today we can't see, but 
that's still a massive scale of financial autonomy, wealth, um, very high banking level again. And this is something which we tend to forget when we look at um, still again what you think the end of the Middle Ages and the rise of, you know, um, another part of Europe, right? This is true. This is happening. It's undeniable, but it's also happening, overlapping with a continuous amount of protagonism as far as Southern European and, generally speaking, Catholic um, power after the Reformation uh, is concerned, right? Uh, in, also in Germany, in Southern Germany, Catholic Germany is the richer Germany. And, um, yes, Spain is also... But also, if you look at France, uh, that's also a... A chunk we we do not often render the the adequate due when we think about how much uh, state building and banking and sort of broader power concentration and how much effort that required really really represented right so it's um again the Middle Ages blow your mind I would say because they they tell you what is not obvious at all. Right, at least w what you have not been told normally, and I would say that of course there are there is plenty of um, of bibliography and this stuff. Like you can find this information here and there. People tell me, why don't you write a, a bibliography? I can give you a bibliography. Do you want a bibliography? I can give you I don't know seventy titles. The problem is, are you going to read them all? Are you going to study them? Are you going to extrapolate this information? What do you need that? Will you read the uh, uh, Romanie Genoise by Ballard, right? Uh, Rome, 1978. Who will read that? Are you kidding me? Right? Uh, even if you read, I don't know, Mallet's The Florentine Galleys of the 15th Century, do you think that that's something you will simply get yourself into? If you uh, have... Okay, let, let's skip here the, the criticism and more, but just for saying, right, this is not something I say just as, 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 as an alibi or as an excuse, right? One must study history always in a way that makes sense, not just uh, because, I don't know, you think there is a place where you read history or you um and and that history is fixed it's basically you know uh just uh written in the firmament uh in the sky and it's um uh it's nowhere else to be to be found uh to be inquired to be criticized to be um you know, to be appreciated. Um, history must be studied for real, right? It can't be just read, right? And this, this channel is, I would say, the guide to that, right? It's, it's not just the information. It's embarrassing, really, for me just to pretend that you can read things just because I give you a list of titles. Right, that, that's insane, right? Uh, I have, like, you have the greatest opportunity. You have someone who has actually gotten the chevron, right, passing through that criticism that you need, and you. And there are some people. I think my audience is not, but they, they still believe that fundamentally, um, all this leads to is you being a sort of um, strange monad that knows only his field, uh, his own field, and. Um, and that uh, cannot be relied upon when, when there is some criticism or in that, uh, you know, uh, in, insight, let's say, and, and analysis and whatever, just because, you know, it's, it's not your field of expertise. The level I treat history on YouTube is, of course, uh, not that. Right? It is very, very high. There is nothing on YouTube of the same kind. But, of course, in order to be an expert, you have to be beyond and what uh, also does that mean if you're not an expert in that only specific field you cannot understand 
the level of quality in your specific field. I'm an expert in my specific field and I almost never talk about this on YouTube. Um, simply because, you know, either I read what I write, I think at that point it would sort of make more sense in a way, um, or because it's it's not at the same level I can I research, right? Because if I had to pose you all the problems I have, I pose myself when I research, I would um, essentially just talk things that you would find tremendously boring um, because they're in, in many ways minimal, but they are what gi give me the insight that and the perspective that allows me to evaluate other material that I've simply read extensively and intensively and I started and I had to research on and whatever in my decades of of historical study um, and I don't do much else beside that right so it's extremely easy for a human brain to learn the capacity to evaluate these systems just by actually having I would say look my background I'm, I'm lucky to have received just type of academic culture that consists in a lot a lot of theory and a lot a lot of practice and of course I see it, I tour the world and that thing dies there are very few people who do this as well so the, the, the wide amount of the rest is just making the, the bare minimum to get something published they don't do it for uh, the passion they do it for you know hope that they will have a uh, a, a career um, and they will not know history right and it will convince you that, uh, that with the, this paranoia it is very easy to grapple people with um, that essentially there is no such thing like um, you know like somebody who can't tell you history at this level because you think that this level is sort of ultra advanced it is advanced but it's not ultra advanced right um, and if you don't know the difference, it's because, of course, you have not been there. Uh, I've been there, and I tell you, look, this part of history is told like this, because this and this and that reason, the reasons that I'm pointing you out. Right, and for some people that haven't even r gotten to what level that I proportionally call advanced, that are sometimes even historians, this seems, you know, scary. Because they haven't met a person like me that has simply read, surely a bit more than the average, which doesn't take anything, right? And can illustrate these topics actually without too much difficulty because they're actually very easy to talk in, in this advanced level. Um, and it's that easy to teach them. And people somehow don't understand this. And especially most people in general don't, don't want to learn this type of history because it's too much, because they don't have two hours a day to listen to me and trying to understand, to, to read, to research about that. Because what I say in itself is too much work. Right, so it, it's the strange limbo in which I, um, you know, the the ones who have some alleged academic background distrust because they feel threatened by what I do, because they don't believe I do what I do and, and I know the things I know. Um, and then there are, there are the people who just have no idea that this dimension even exists. So that they don't understand that history even exists in the first place, and so they they think it's some sort of strange cartoon they can't watch and you know no, grow knowledgeable without work. That's kind of a very difficult thing. Again, it, this always sounds like I got it, the others don't. But believe me, when you come across that three hundred times, you you are posing yourself always the same question. At some point, you start doing so. All right, because you realize it's it's a waste of time. Right, the, the day of the exception may come, but I still haven't seen that. And I find it terrifying because it seems like the, the, the rest of the system is terribly unqualified. And I do what I do on Shrapunk because I hope that people can understand what we need in order to fix things, culturally, educationally, morally, scientifically, uh, and more. I always need to tell this because the time sometimes you see I, I started this ramble now because I got amazed by the same history right that I learned um, and I I think it, it sort of um, just 
incredible right in in of itself and i want to know more and i want to study more etc so i that's why i'm doing this uh in the first place all right for today however i stop it here i just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.